everybody and welcome to another episode on my channel. Sorry for the two week hiatus there. I was away from my computer and away from YouTube. I had to spend some much needed time with my family. We were at the lake sort of decompressing from the hectic uh, work life that I've had recently. But I am back here on YouTube to spread my investing knowledge with you great folks. So without further ado, we're going to dive right into this video. It's a super exciting video and I think that you will find a lot of value in this video. So we're going to look at the purchases that I made this week. I started a new position in BAM, otherwise known as Brookfield Asset Management. Now, if you're familiar with my YouTube channel, you would have seen that I made a full, I believe, 45 minute video on Brookfield Corporation. I detailed the various business lines that Brookfield is in, went through their financials, uh, even looked at one of the interviews with their CEO, Bruce Flat, and made some comments there. So again, I made that, Brook, that video on Brookfield on my channel. If you haven't seen it, I encourage you to watch it and I will leave a link in the top right hand corner, which you should be seeing now. All right, so that's for Brookfield Corporation, but now we're gonna look at Brookfield Asset Management and why I decided to start a position. So we're gonna go and look at Brookfield Asset Management's business and we'll be doing that by going to the Brookfield website, Brookfield Asset Management, and looking at the presentations here. Again, follow along on the website if you like. It's actually very useful and they've laid out their presentations in a very easy or user-friendly way. Let's click the most recent investment presentation or investor presentation. All right, there we go. Brookfield Asset Management, the investor presentation of August, 2023. So Brookfield at a glance. So Brookfield Asset Management is one of the largest and fastest growing alternative asset managers in the world, distinguished by a hundred plus year history of owning and operating real assets and businesses that provide essential services. So again, alternative asset managers or alternative assets, what they mean by that is investing in to real assets. So the traditional asset classes or things that you would invest in are things such as bonds and stocks, but alternative assets or what they state as real assets. So that could be things like real estate, uh, infrastructures, uh, toll booths, roads, uh, those physical or different alternative assets. And again, it is very tangible. So when you're thinking of a real asset or an alternative asset, I would suggest thinking about them as a real asset or a business. So here they have about 850 billion of AUM or assets under management and 450 billion of that is fee bearing capital. So what Brookfield Asset Management does is they manage this these billions of dollars for investors and they collect fees on that money that is managed and invested into these real assets. So VAM or Brookfield Asset Management operates in 30 countries across five continents. Uh, 2,500 investment and asset management professionals supported by 200,000 operating employees. So it's a very, very large company. They have more than 2,000 institutional clients across the globe. That is amazing. So welcome to the new Brookfield Asset Management. So this, again, might be a little complicated, but I'm going to do my best to explain it here. So what happened was, and again, if you, if you did watch my video on Brookfield Corporation, I encourage you to go back to my channel and go and watch that because I actually made a full uh, graph or a, a nice infographic here explaining how these are now organized. But basically what happened was Brookfield Asset Management encapsulated all of these different businesses. But back in December, 2022, the Brookfield decided to distribute about 25% of this asset management business as Brookfield Asset Management trading under ticker the ticker BAM, and the remaining 75% is owned by Brookfield. So they made this infographic here to show that. So Brookfield Corporation has about 75% ownership in this asset management business, and Brookfield Asset Management LTD has 25% ownership in this Brookfield Asset Management business. So that right there shows the 100% ownership of the Brookfield Asset Management business. So they decided to separate these businesses for several important benefits. And I think that they're all very valid and very important for the different types of investors that are looking for different things. So they said it compares more directly to alternative asset management peers. So they're providing a way for 
investors to allow more comparability across the different asset managers when in, when deciding or per, doing analysis on which alternative asset manager to invest into. The pure play business is simpler to understand and easier to value. That is 100% true. And it creates the opportunity to attract new investors as the combined business has historically been under-owned and under-followed by alternative asset management investors and research analysts. So what they mean by this attracting new investors, as we'll see later, is the new Brookfield Asset Management here is a very simple to understand business because it just collects fees from managing the, the fee-bearing capital or the assets under management under the asset assets under management of the Brookfield <laughs> asset management business. So that was a, that was a word uh, or mouthful, but basically what Brookfield asset management LTT does is it just collects fees from Brookfield asset management and then it distributes those fees in the forms of dividends uh, back to shareholders. So this now appeals a lot more to income oriented investors and dividend investors because it provides a higher level or of income or a higher dividend yield and it's a very easy to understand business as we will look at their balance sheet and income statement later. Now, if we look at them, it operates with industry leading metrics. So 100% fee related earnings as a percentage of their DE, 84% of that fee bearing capital is long term or permanent. So that is very, very interesting. So of the fees or the fee bearing capital that they raise, so that's that assets under management, 84% of that is long-term or permanent. So that is a very stable stream of income for Brookfield Asset Management. Now look at these margins. Fee-related earnings margins are 55 to 60%. Those are huge, huge margins. And what I like to see here is 15 to 20% fee-related earnings growth targets. So they're targeting 15 to 20% of fee-related earnings growth for the foreseeable future. Now that is, spectacular growth 15 to 20 percent in those earnings i i can you know rarely think of businesses that can do that there are a few in the world but this is just amazing and they have a 90 percent plus dividend payout ratio so as before like i said this appeals uh very very highly to dividend investors they they like this uh 90 percent dividend payout ratio you're getting your uh capital back in the form of a dividend at 90 percent plus so you're getting a very, a very decent dividend yield and no debt. It's an asset light balance sheet, as we'll see when we look at their balance uh, sheet, but they have no debt in this Brookfield Asset Management, as opposed to the corporation, which holds the assets and also the liabilities. But the manager here has no debt. All that debt is held with the corporation and not the asset manager. Built on a hundred year foundation. So while the stock is new, their market leadership, commitment to clients, and value creation approach remains unchanged. So here they're just talking about their expertise. You know, they've been doing this for over 100 years. They're one of the world's largest asset managers over the past 25 years. Scale, they have a lot of access to specific capital inflows and multi-asset classes and managers. They have a lot of access to a lot of great businesses. And essential assets, their businesses, you know, we'll, we'll see an infographic later, but they're basically positioned around what they call the secular tailwinds being renewable power. So renewable power is only gaining traction, uh, infrastructure, infrastructure is very important and real estate and credit Brookfield ecosystem. So they have $175 billion of discretionary capital across the broader Brookfield organization, which can be invested alongside their funds. They have diversified businesses and amazing relationships with investors and partners, which help de deliver superior investment performance and provide the highest level of client service. So here's that global presence that they're talking about. So they're in North America, they have about 513 billion of assets out there. South America, 56 billion. Europe and Middle East, this is what I'm most excited about along with Asian, Asia Pacific. They're taking some great strides here and investing a lot of money. I believe that a lot of growth will come from these two uh, sections or regions in the upcoming years. So they invest in the backbone of the global economy, they invest in high quality essential assets and businesses. So again, like we saw $440 billion of fee bearing capital, and that's split up between renewable power and transition at 52 billion, 97 billion in infrastructure, 
41 billion in private equity, 98 billion in real estate, 152 billion in credit and other. Position for strong growth. So yeah, these these slides are are super great. I love how, you know, it's a billion dollar or 850 billion dollar business and these slides are made very easy to understand, but as we can see here, why are investors choosing to invest their growing capital base in alternative assets? So they say that they have excess returns, diversification, less volatility, and predictable cash flows. So let's look at these individually. So excess returns. So traditional investments, such as bond yields, you know, they can go from zero to 4%. And, you know, target private credit compared to those bond yields is 7 to 8%. So that is great outperformance there. And when we look at stocks or public equity returns that they call them, investing in stocks, 11 to 12%. When looking at their target real assets and private equity investments, they're at 12 to 20%. So they can literally almost double the returns here in each of these different categories. So check off your excess returns. Diversification. So diversification, you're diversifying across various business segments when you're investing in Brookfield Asset Management. Like we saw here, there are different segments being renewable power and transition infrastructure, private equity, real estate, and credit. So you're getting exposure to a bunch of these different asset classes. Less volatility, and that is true because the public equity market or the stock market can be extremely volatile. It's based a lot more on emotion than actual areas of the business. Here, because these are, or your funds would be invested into real assets, they are less volatile. You're not worried about checking them, uh, checking the prices day to day, about the various infrastructure assets or the real estate assets that Brookfield uh, Asset Management has a part of or Brookfield Corporation owns, they are less volatile. You're just counting on those cash flows coming in and they are predictable cash flows. Predictable rent payments are due, you know what they are, various infrastructure asset payments. So it's predictable levels of cash flows. And here we can see why are investors worldwide turning to alternative assets. So as institutional investors increase their allocation to alternatives, the overall industry saw rapid expansion and is estimated to grow to $23 trillion by 2026. It's $23 trillion. So here we can see the alternative assets under management in trillions since 2010, starting at $4 trillion and projected to grow to 2026 at 23.2 trillion. That's over five times the growth of investments of these institutional investors into alternative assets. So these alternative assets that Brookfield Asset Management manages and gains fee bearing uh, revenue stream on these alternative assets. And here we can see the institutional allocation of alternative assets. So when they say institutional, so there's a difference between us as private investors and institutional money. So that is things such as pension funds. So those are talking about hundreds of millions or trillions of dollars and billions of dollars. Those, those funds, they are turning more towards investing to alternative assets. So these are huge dollar volumes. So we can see originally in 2000, only about 5% of the institutional money or investments was in alternative assets. Fast forward to 2021, it has six times to 30% of their portfolios being weighted into alternative assets. Now projected to 2030, Brookfield believes that it will be about 60% of their allocation or their fund allocation into alternative assets. And when you see the, the differing here in the scales, they're actually thinking that in institutional investments will be higher in alternative assets than traditional assets such as stocks and bonds. So that is very awesome in terms of Brookfield Asset Management business. And it's just a great snippet of information to have as an investor. All right, so here we can see those secular tailwinds that they were talking about. So they believe that trillions of dollars will be needed to be invested as the world adapts to paradigm shifts and their assets sit at the epicenter of many of these trends. So we're gonna look at each of these. So Brookfield here in the middle. So digitalization. So again, Brookfield has recently made some investments into data centers, uh, housing these data centers and owning them. So th because of the whole AI, AI trend and more and more data being used basically on a, on a daily basis by everyone in the world, these data centers are gonna play a key part of the future 
we are gonna need a bunch of space or storage space to store all this cloud information and process it. So Brookfield right here is taking the edge and they are investing into these data centers because they believe that you know digital information is only gonna grow, which I, I happen to agree with them. Decarbonization, so again, that is reducing our rate of carbon there and deglobalization, so it's weird. This is kind of a, a different trend. You know, in the past we've seen globalization, so that's where we're moving to manufacturing and things like that into cheaper cheaper places so manufacturing traditionally was in american canada and then it shifted to china asia india because of the cheaper cost of manufacturing and other items but now specific items as we've seen have now been starting to be remade in america and canada things such as computer chips because what a lot of the world leaders realized was that because we were relying so much on these relationships between different countries that specific countries and i won't get into detail specific countries in specific places had a lot more control over the countries that did not produce these items uh, so they now would like to bring some of this manufacturing of these specific items back to their home uh, country and that is known as deglobalization and again it's not just for manufacturing it can be across a, ver a variety of services but again that is deglobalization so people are now trying to make things or produce services back in their home country to not rely on other countries as much. Now here we can see their fee bearing capital and the way it is split up. So again, 440 billion in fee bearing capital, or instead of a different term here would be, this is the investments that they use that they generate their revenues from because they charge fees on, these rev on, these, on this uh, capital. So here we can see in blue, largest being their credit and other 98 billion here in real estate private equity at 41 billion infrastructure at 97 billion this is my my favorite slice of the pie i think this is just only going to keep growing and then 52 billion in renewable power and transition so again a very diverse uh, makeup of their fee bearing capital and ultimately their revenues so an integrated approach. So here they're just talking about their ESG practices. Uh, they manage their investments with integrity. They assess the climate impact, align with their industry leading ESG frameworks and remain committed to a diverse and inclusive workplace. So this is a great slide. Here we can see superior investment performance drives inflows. So they're saying their strategy enables them to deliver strong returns for their clients across their businesses. Strong returns drive future growth 100% agreed. So here what they've done is given us the different funds or the different sectors in which they invest in or invest into on behalf of their clients, the fund history that it, ha it has. So again, infrastructure being 13 years, renewable power 13 years, private equity 22 years, real estate 17 years, credit 35 years. And then we can see the IRR and the net IRR, both in gross and net. So IIR, if you're not familiar with that, stands for the internal rate of return. And here we can see, I, I would just like to look at the net basis. So that's net of any fees to the investors. Infrastructure has been about 13% per year. Renewable power, 9% per year. Private equity, an amazing 22% per year. Real estate at 19% per year and credit at 16% per year. So these are amazing market beating returns. This is why I like Brookfield Asset Management, and this is just a snapshot into their different funds that they manage for investors. So here we just have a snippet essentially of their, of their uh, balance sheet and their specific, um, what do you call it, business segments, I guess. So renewable, we, we, we already looked at these, so these, and these again are the fund commitments. So these are 83 billion called uncalled commitments and they have them split into the various sectors that we saw before and the cash on hand 2.9 billion cash on bam's balance sheet so again we will look at that when we look at the balance sheet and having this cash on hand allows them to put that cash to work when they see opportunities that are attractive so strong portfolio growth so this is an amazing slide as well they have a 2023 target of 100 billion dollars of capital inflows on track to hit target of 1 trillion of fee bearing capital in five years. So what does that represent? It's just amazing growth to think about this. 2017 until Q2 2023, $126 billion in 2017. They've grown that to $440 billion in 2023. That is astounding. And to think they're actually communicating to us that by 2027, 
they're going to have $973 billion, almost $1 trillion of fee-bearing capital. So that represents a 24% compound annual growth rate of fee-bearing capital, which will result in huge increases to revenue and hopefully net income and distributable earnings as well. Now here we can look at their long-term and perpetual and perpetual capital. So at the beginning of the slideshow, I told you I was amazed by how, how much of this uh, capital is long-term and they say 84% of that capital is long dated or perpetual. So 84% here being the ones enclosed in orange. So 52% is long-term private funds. So this is the funds that are locked in for a long-term investment that are held privately. And we have permanent capital vehicles. So these are held permanently. So the assets under management here will be held basically permanently. And we have perpetual strategies right here. And then the liquid strategies, these again are strategies that investors can pull out at any time. So about 84% of that is uh, perpetual or long dated. So very long-term capital committed to these projects, which results in long-term assets under management, which then equates to long term fee bearing capital and fees charged on managing that capital for brookfield so it is an amazing business all right so they've driven driven uh sorry strong financial performance and as you can see here uh, basically 18 percent compound annual growth rate from 2017 projected until 2027 of uh, the fee related earnings so again this being those earnings that they uh, generate for managing those assets on behalf of the investors. So here we have uh, American Equity Life. So Brookfield Reinsurance, which we will look at in a section in a second, they announced that it announced an agreement to acquire American Equity Life or AEL, the largest independent annuities provider. BAM is not a party to this transaction. They are separate entities, but they are set to benefit in several meaningful ways. So immediate, immediate benefits will come from an additional $50 billion in fee-bearing capital and increased public float. And future benefits will accrue over time as more policies are written and they will be able to allocate this capital into the private funds. So basically how it works or what they're saying here is Brookfield Reinsurance, which again we will look at in a moment, they are going to commit a $50 billion of the capital that they have in their insurance company to let Brookfield Asset Management manage those funds and generate great returns and more fee fees on those assets as they move forward. So again, we'll look at that in a minute. So the conclusion here on Brookfield Asset Management, uh, the best is yet to come. I, I love this slide. So embedded organic growth, they're a leader in, rapid, in a rapidly growing industry, highly differentiated strategy, proven track record, all, all true and all great optionality for inorganic, inorganic growth. So then again, they can continue to uh, take capital and gravitate towards larger, more diverse uh, managers. They can consolidate, they can buy other, other asset managers and, and things like that and other businesses. So that is Brookfield Asset Management in a glance. I hope, I hope you enjoyed that. Now we're going to go and look at the insurance, Brookfield Reinsurance. So this is probably what I'm most excited about here. And once I read this investor presentation, uh, it only further uh, heightened my conviction in Brookfield Asset Management. So here, Brookfield Asset Management and Brookfield RE or Brookfield Reinsurance Strategy. So they had their speakers speaking here. All right, so Brookfield's insurance strategy. That's number one. The American Equity Life Transaction, Future Growth and Benefits to BAM. All right, Brookfield's insurance strategy. So here we can see Brookfield Reinsurance. They operate in a leading capital solutions business providing insurance and reinsurance services to, Brook to institutions and individuals. So basically what they're saying is that they have a large insurance business and reinsurance business and they are able to provide these services to specific uh, 
clients and they have deep industry relationships, a bunch of insurance professionals and investment professionals as well. So what I'm going to do here is scroll down and look at the key highlights. So the insurance solutions over the past few years, Brookfield Reinsurance has accumulated scale across a diversified range of insurance lines. So they've got a $45 billion insurance float. So basically what an insurance flow is, the funds that they have for the insurance policies, but what they are stating here is they have access to all of this capital. And the thing is with insurance companies, they don't just keep that those funds on the side waiting to pay out policies. They then invest those funds to generate a return, which is higher than the uh, return that they would have or the cost of gaining that capital from the specific policy holders. So when you're paying them your money, they are investing that money away until the insurance policy is needed to pay, be paid out or specific insurance policies need to be paid out or whether they don't. So they are gaining money on that payment or that insurance payment, otherwise known as the insurance float. So 40 billion uh, of assets backing those life, life insurances and annuities and 5 billion of assets backing the property and casualty insurance. Here you can see their rated operating platform A, uh, A minus, and they've already invested 24 billion of this with Brookfield Asset Management. And Brookfield Asset Management earns 25 BPS or BIPs, also known as basis points on the management assets or $60 million annually. So Brookfield is gaining access to these funds here from Brookfield Reinsurance and is then investing them into the alternative asset management space and earning great returns on that money. So here we can see, this is probably the slide that got me the most excited, um, the near-term growth. So post-closing of the American Equity Life and another acquisition, Argo, again, it is smaller. Uh, the insurance flow will grow to $100 billion dollars with up to 75 billion under management with BAM. So this is gonna be 75 billion additional dollars that Brookfield Asset Management will be able to invest into alternative assets and gain fee bearing capital or fees generated on these assets under management. So this is a very great use of the synergies of the Brookfield ecosystem. So $45 billion of this current float of the Brookfield Reinsurance plus the $50 billion acquisition that will be closing closing soon plus the other $5 billion acquisition results in 2024 of $100 billion of an insurance float of which $75 billion will be, uh, as, will be sorry, um, managed under Brookfield Asset Management. So this scaled portfolio is expected to generate 15 to 20% returns on $10 billion of capital deployed in the business. So 15 to 20% returns on that capital deployed. So here we can see Brookfield Reinsurance, and they're just stating again why they're leveraging the Brookfield Asset Management's investment experience. So it's going to be invested across these specific sectors because they provide strong risk adjusted returns. The, that is again renewable power and transition, infrastructure, real estate, and credit. So here we can see the American Equity Life transaction overview, and they kind of provide some details there. So I'll just give you the bullet points here. They have about $50 billion in assets, top 10 fixed annuity right in the United States, best in class management and a highly valuable brand. So a very strong business with historical annuities of four to 6 billion annually. And again, it's given an A minus rating by uh, the various credit agencies such as S&P and Finch. So the Brookfield opportunity, like we saw before, they're gonna provide them with 50 billion in new uh, bearing capital. So this again is flowing from the uh, Brookfield reinsurance and it's going to grow further under assets under management for Brookfield Asset Management. $10 billion of liquid assets to redeploy resulting in 15 to 20% returns on equity in line with long-term targets. And we're going to look at the future growth here. So the future growth of Brookfield reinsurance, it's in my opinion, the growth is really going to come from these acquisitions where they are actually gonna be looking at expanding into new markets, such as the UK, Western Europe, Asia, and Australia. These are these inorganic growth opportunities. Again, they will have some organic le levers here, which they're gonna be able to pull, but I believe that the large growth is gonna come from these acquisitions, or these large uh, block reinsurance transactions that they call them, by spreading and expanding into these new markets right here, UK, Western Europe, Asia, and Australia. All right, now this slide right here is just showing the next stage of growth. 
So they're going to be putting Brookfield Reinsurance on a path to $250 billion of AUM over the next five years. And they're going to be doing this again here. We saw in 2021, it was about $2 billion. They growth from completed and announced transactions. So it's going to, you know, hopefully once these uh, Argo and AEL uh, transactions go through these acquisitions, they'll be at about $100 billion in 2024. And they're projecting by 2028 to be at $250 billion. So they've got another $150 billion, which they haven't disclosed to us. That are that are apparently in the plans. So organic growth and inorganic growth. I believe a lot of this 150 billion is going to come from inorganic growth channels that they mentioned up here by expanding into new markets such as UK, Western Europe, Asia, and Australia. And that's probably going to make up the bulk of the 150 billion growth because I don't see a large part of this being organic growth here. So I believe that they can reach this 250 billion dollar target by 2028. They have a great history of meeting their communicated uh, investor targets so I, I think that they're they should be able to actually hit this 250 billion i just believe a lot of it is going to come from inorganic growth and the great thing about owning bam or brookfield asset management is the more that the reinsurance business grows the more that they are able to give to brookfield asset management and then the higher fees or the higher revenue that brookfield asset management can then generate and distribute to us as investors so here we can then again see that benefit to BAM and I'm not gonna go over this because we went over this in the last slide and this as well. And if you want, you are definitely free to take a pause or a screenshot here and look at the various uh, credit AUM and what it's made up of here and the future opportunities. So that was Brookfield Asset Management and their fuel, I believe being Brookfield Reinsurance and how it's gonna look like over the next few years and why I decided to invest into them. So what we're going to look at now is Brookfield Asset Management and the ticker. So Brookfield Asset Management trades under BAM.TO on the TSX. And I'm looking at it here in Canadian. You can just type in BAM stock and look at it in US if you want it as well. It's trading at about $47. I basically got into it around $47 Canadian uh, on Friday. And you can see the forward dividend yield at 3.64% and other various characteristics. So now... I'm going to show you my investment thesis for why I am investing into Brookfield Asset Management as opposed to all of those other factors that we saw. And then we are going to do a yield on cost calculation as well. So let's go and look at the yield on cost calculator. So I'm going to type in the starting yield. So again, this is going to back up my investment thesis. And I'm basically showing you what a yield on cost is. So again, I should probably back up and show you and explain what a yield on cost is. And shout out to the dividend calculator here. You can just Google that. It's a dividendcalculator.com. And basically the yield on cost is a concept where you calculate your existing yield versus the share price you paid when you, when you purchased the investment, not your current share price. So for people who buy dividend growth stocks, such as myself, uh, the yield on cost metric is a way to measure the annual income or return on your individu individual or an original investment if you hold it for years. So if the dividend grows, while at the same time you reinvest your dividend, you can achieve even more compounding of your return. So again, I'm gonna show you how, how this works in a minute, but basically think about it this way. If I'm investing $2,000, I want to know my yield on cost or how much income that will generate to me over the coming years on my initial $2,000 investment. So I'm going to show you now how that works. So we're going to look at some different characteristics that we will need from Brookfield in order to run this calculator. So you can see the dividend yield here is about 3.6%. So we're going to type in 3.6%. The dividend growth rate. So they stated that it would grow anywhere from 15 to 20% per year in the investor presentation. And long term, I think I think that that's possible, but I'm a little bit more, I want to say, risk averse. So I'm going to assume that it grows at 10% per year just to be a little bit more risk averse. Now, the number of shares held, I'm going to say 40 because I want to hopefully get up to a $2,000 position. And the cost per share, I'm just going to round it to a nice $50, even though I bought it at 47 And I'm going to hold it for a nice 20-year uh, period. So we're going to click calculate and it's going to give us, we're going to be looking at it with a reinvestment of my dividend because that is what I'm going to be doing. So initially 
I wanted to know my yield on cost and income if I bought 40 shares of a $50 stock, in this point being Brookfield Asset Management, for a total investment cost of $2,000. Stock started with a 3.6% yield and has a dividend growth rate of 10%, and I plan to hold it for 20 years. So here we can see if I started with $2,000, I would end up with 13000 or $13,000. 800, let's say $900 for a total gain of 594%. So over 20 years, that would have made my average annual gain 29.7%. So one thing that you need to note here is this is not counting share price fluctuations and other things such as investments or reinvestments. So like there's various aspects here that this is not guaranteed to be a 30% return per year. This was just if I was compounding my dividend over time. And again, this point right here, this is not really the important part of the video that I wanted to show you. What I really wanna show you here is this reinvestment of the dividend and the growth of that dividend over time. So if this Brookfield Asset Management continues to grow its dividend as they've communicated to us, and I chose a 10% growth rate here, this would be the result. So. If you look at it here, you can see the yearly income coming from this investment starts pretty low at $72. But as we go through the number of years here, and as you can see, once we get up to basically year 19 and 20, that original $2,000 investment, I generate more than that here in year 20 as my dividends. So $2,500 theoretically could be coming to me in dividend income alone. And that right there is my yield on cost. I am generating a higher dividend income than that of my initial investment. So that is really cool to see. I encourage you to play with this calculator, uh, set different time frames. You know, you can do it at, let's say, 15 years, and then you can see what your, your return would have been. You could have done it at, at different levels of different returns. And it's it's really cool to see because you can see how much, how much dividend income you can generate and what these dividend growth rates actually do to the to the income or the dividend income. Because when you start with a low dividend, but it grows very rapidly, your yield on cost or your dividend on your original investment grows exponentially as I previously shown. So that's just something to play with again and feel free to do that on your own time. That's one of the reasons why I decided to invest into Brookfield Asset Management again, because they are a high dividend grower and I plan to hold this investment for a long, long time period. That, in addition to the qualitative characteristics that I showed in this video, were my thesis on investing into Brookfield Asset Management. So that has been Brookfield Asset Management. I hope you enjoyed this video. Uh, I will probably release another video on Brookfield, or probably a, a bunch of videos on Brookfield in the upcoming weeks and months, because I feel very strongly about this business, and I'll break down the balance sheet, the income statement, the cash flows, the various financial metrics and financial statements of them. I just feel like I went maybe a little bit too long here on this video, but uh, that's what I do when I get excited. I share a lot of knowledge and, and, and my thesis behind my investments. So if you enjoyed this content, I encourage you to subscribe to the channel. Please leave a like and please leave any comments you have below in the uh, section. I read them and I respond to them very diligently and I hope you enjoyed the video. Thank you again for your time, and I hope you have a great day. Please note, I am not a financial advisor by any means. All investing is risky, so please do your due diligence, as I am not responsible for any investing decisions you make or any investing losses you incur. Thank you again, and have a great day. Bye.